The dieselization of America's locomotive industry is certainly an interesting topic when it comes to railroad history, but that topic can't be discussed without going into detail regarding EMD, Electromotive Diesel, which was a company formed in 1922 that pioneered diesel traction on America's railway system. Over the following few decades, they would actually drive multiple different steam locomotive manufacturers into bankruptcy and become a dominant force in the locomotive industry. Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British rail critics, and of course, my underwater train finders. You are the reason why this content remains dieselized. And today, we are going to discuss EMD. They come up a lot. Like, a lot whenever I talk about railroad companies, whether they be the actual railroads or locomotive manufacturers, EMD is always standing somewhere around the topic because, well, they had a tremendous amount of influence on how the industry went, particularly in the 1940s and the 1950s. This is the story of EMD. The company that would eventually be known as EMD was actually not called EMD initially. It was called Electromotive Engineering Corporation, and it was founded by Harold L. Hamilton and Paul Turner in Cleveland, Ohio in 1922. That original name didn't last super long. They would actually change it within the first year to Electromotive Company, a much shorter name, and abbreviate it to EMC. They wanted to bring internal combustion traction to the railroad industry, which was an incredibly large industry at the time, and they were actually utilizing General Electric's internal combustion electric propulsion, as well as their control systems. Hamilton himself had actually worked on railroads before, as a fireman and an engineer on the Southern Pacific Railroad. He also became a manager with the Florida East Coast Railway, before he left for a marketing position with the White Motor Company, which is an early manufacturer of trucks and buses in Denver, Colorado. It was there that Hamilton learned a lot about the automotive industry, particularly involving training and service agreements, which were a big part of White Motors' marketing packages. Hamilton would take those ideas on to EMC, as he felt that it would actually be very profitable and lucrative for both buyer and seller if locomotive manufacturers handled their services more like the automotive industry did. Since he had worked for the railroads before, he knew exactly what they needed, particularly when it came to branch line services. And along with his partner, as well as a designer they hired, they started working on a new generation of self-propelled rail cars. In 1923, they actually sold two gasoline-powered rail motor cars, one to the Chicago Great Western and the other to Northern Pacific. At the time, the company was still pretty small, so they subcontracted the body construction to the St. Louis Car Company, the electrical components to General Electric, and the prime mover to the Winton Engine Company of Cleveland, Ohio. So there were a lot of hands in this first outing. Those motor cars would be delivered in 1924 and were actually pretty good. They worked well, which was good because sales were conditional on satisfactory performance. The railroads did not agree to outright buy them until they tested well. And in 1925, they entered full-scale production, and they wound up selling 27 of the rail cars. The idea of the rail cars, which sometimes are called doodlebugs, was that they could be used for smaller lines and passenger services. It was much more efficient to utilize these doodlebugs in this regard. But in the 1930s, General Motors was seeking to enter production of diesel engines and broaden their range of applications. They wound up purchasing the Winton Engine Company because they already had a product line that included a variety of stationary and marine diesel engines, as well as spark ignition engines for heavy vehicles. But 
General Motors did notice EMC and saw their role in developing and marketing Winton engine heavy vehicles, particularly for the railroad industry. GM definitely wanted a piece of that puzzle. So, because they had just so much money at the time, they outright purchased EMC as well, renaming them to the Electromotive Corporation. Still EMC, but slightly different. And they were now a wholly owned subsidiary of General Motors. This was a big deal, and to be fair, it was kind of good for EMC because now they had the financial backing of General Motors. And they were supported by the General Motors Research Division that was headed by Charles F. Kettering. The Winton side of things focused on developing diesel engines with improved power to weight ratios and output flexibility that was suitable for mobile use. You know, like on a locomotive. And Eugene W. Kettering, who was the son of Charles Kettering, led Winton's side of the development project. In 1933, EMC designed the power setups for the Zephyr and the M10,000 streamliners. These were actually considered technical breakthroughs in the power and speed available with their propulsion systems. The Zephyr, in particular, used the first major product of the new GM Winton Venture, which was a 600 horsepower, 8 cylinder version of the Winton 201A. Roots blown, uniflow scavenged, unit injected, two stroke diesel engine. At the time, Bud and Pullman Standard were actually entering contracts to build more diesel-powered streamliners themselves, and they wound up becoming major customers of EMC. Diesel power was considered very suitable for small, lightweight, and high-speed trains, in addition to switching service and yards. Though the idea of outright replacing steam didn't exist just yet. Either way, EMC believed that it was possible to enhance the role of diesel in railroading. So, they invested in a new locomotive factory, and started development work on the locomotives that it would produce. The factory was headquartered on 55th Street in McCook, Illinois, just west of Chicago. They were making enough money to stay afloat during the Great Depression, and in 1935, they put out the 1800 horsepower BB development design locomotives that featured multiple unit control systems, which would become the basis of cab booster locomotive sets that they would become famous for. The twin engine format would also be adopted for the newest Zephyr in 1936 and EMC's E-Series streamlined passenger locomotives that their new factory began producing in 1937. Now the E-Series are a big deal here. This is really where things started changing because prior to them, EMC was focusing purely on switch engines, which remained the mainstay of their production. But the E-Units were a different matter entirely because they were meant to remain line service. These types of diesels could actually straight up replace most steam engines. This was something that hadn't really been considered before, but if they could pull it off and convince railroads to do that, that would mean a huge market share for EMC and, by extension, General Motors. They had already been pioneering further research into more modern diesel engines. They had a head start against pretty much every other company, with the sole exception of Alco. Alco had produced diesel electric switching engines since the mid-1920s, and they started working on designs to compete with the E-Units in 1939. Baldwin was much less of a concern. They did start focusing on diesel-electric switchers in 1939, but that was a little late to the party, and they still didn't have a proper road unit yet. The economic analysis was actually quite simple for them. Passenger trains didn't make very much money for the railroads in the grand scheme of things, because in order for people to be willing to use them, they had to actually be able to afford it, and it was the Great Depression after all. Steam wasn't exactly that much more expensive than diesel, but it was a little bit in some aspects. There were certain efficiency differences, and the idea was that if they marketed the diesels as being overall more cost effective, that would make those trains more profitable. They could also make more money on their diesels in the technical sense because they standardized production of their locomotives with a proper assembly line setup, something that the automotive industry had been doing for a few years at that point. And they simplified all the processes for ordering, manufacturing, and servicing their locomotives. 
and they offered support services that included financing, training, and field maintenance that would ease a total transition from steam to diesel, and therefore boost their market share in the last years prior to the US entry into World War II. In 1939, they built a four-unit freight locomotive demonstrator, known as the FT. This was a major deal, as it was an evolution of the E-Series. Now they had the F-Series, and the demonstrator's tour was a complete success. Western railroads really liked the idea that diesels could free them from their dependence on rather scarce water supplies for steam locomotives. And in 1940, after incorporating dynamic braking at the suggestion of some of their customers, they were receiving the first orders for the new freight locomotive. The beginning of the 1940s, January 1st, 1941, General Motors actually opted to move the production of locomotive engines directly under the authority of EMC, and they renamed them the Electromotive Division, EMD. As a result, EMD became a fully self-contained development, production, marketing, and service entity. Yes, they were owned by General Motors, but all their work was done in-house. They didn't have to rely on anyone else. That same month, they actually delivered the first FT unit to Santa Fe, numbered Unit 100. And through that next year, they were in complete full tilt stride production of road and switch locomotives, becoming the world's biggest manufacturer of these types of diesels. When America entered World War II, however, that did slow EMD's locomotive production. United States Navy ships actually gained priority for diesel power and the petroleum crisis of 1942-43 to 43 actually briefly made steam locomotives, which were coal-fired, a more attractive option for railroads. The War Production Board actually stopped production of new passenger equipment between September 1942 and December 1944 because it was not considered important for the war effort at the time. Later on, however, diesel locomotive production for freight service was picking up as more engines were needed to haul wartime supplies. By the time the FT model was replaced in 1945, they had managed to make 555 cab units and 541 booster units. Because of the way the War Production Board had handled things, EMD actually emerged from World War II with a significant advantage over their competitors, particularly Alco and Baldwin. EMD had already entered World War II with fully developed lines of mainline road diesels, and Alco and Baldwin could only get away with making diesel switchers. Alco had made mainline diesels before, but none of them had been particularly successful. EMD was ahead of them in terms of technical development, with much higher powered diesels in the critical post-war years. Their new model passenger locomotives were delivered in February 1945, and new models for their freight locomotives started appearing later that same year, in the beginning of 1946. By the late 1940s, most American railroads had decided to start dieselizing their locomotive fleets, as they were seeing a significant downturn. Passenger services were actually facing increasing competition from air and automotive travel, and EMD's products were so highly in demand that it opened another production facility in Cleveland, Ohio in 1948. Alco was trying to give them a bit of a run for their money, they actually gained about a 26% market share of diesel locomotives, which wasn't bad, but it wasn't as good as they wanted to either. Alco had higher powered locomotives for main line service, but the problem is that they were less reliable. EMDs were usually pretty good about, you know, working. So even if they were technically a little less powerful than some of Alco's, it didn't matter because they could be expected to function. Other companies did join in the fray to try in vain to put a dent in EMD's business. That included Baldwin, who failed, Fairbanks Morse, who failed, and Lima, who failed. All of them failed against the mighty EMD. Everyone was buying diesels from them, and no one was buying diesels from pretty much anybody else. And by 1950, it was quite obvious that EMD's competitors could not even begin to deal with them. There was nothing anyone could do, and in 1949, they introduced their new EMD GP7 road switcher, which started putting cracks in Alco's market share because they had been consistently selling at least switching units 
But now the GP7 was here, and the GP7 was really good. Then, in 1950, EMD opened a new plant in London, Ontario, Canada. That plant was actually operated by their own Canadian subsidiary, General Motors Diesel, GMD. That was specifically to get around tariffs, that had made it so that importing foreign locomotives was a lot harder for Canadian railways. But if they had a wholly owned subsidiary that operated in Canada already, any product out of it wouldn't be classified as an import. So they could manufacture their diesels up there and sell them up there without having to worry about the tariff issue. This was dangerous for both Alco and Baldwin, who also had their own subsidiaries, Montreal Locomotive Works and Canadian Locomotive Company, respectively. And they had seen success up in Canada up until this happened, but now EMD was starting to look like a more attractive option for some Canadian railways, too. In the 50s, car body diesels started to becoming a little bit unpopular when it came to freight service. Cab units in general were starting to fall out of favor, being seen as a bit dated. So EMD's own road switchers actually displaced their own older model car bodies. But their new road switchers were powerful enough to do mainline service, and their own GP9 actually became the most produced EMD model ever, with 4,112 A units and 165 B units sold between 1954 and 1963. People loved the GP9. They were easy to maintain and very versatile. They could do pretty much anything you wanted. And the GP9 helped sell the idea in America of hood units. They were not at all the first hood unit, but they did make the concept popular. Hood units were much narrower than car bodies and often had walkways around them. You could easily get under them to do maintenance on the main engine and a driver, regardless of what end the cab was at, could see pretty well in both directions regardless. Hood units were a lot more flexible, whereas car bodies were pretty much only good for going in a single direction, and in the mid-50s, the market started changing considerably for EMD, though in a good way. Many of their competitors started failing. Baldwin and Lima were gone. Alco might as well have been, and Fairbanks Morris wasn't exactly making a dent in the market. No one could stop EMD except perhaps one newcomer. A new challenger approaches. That's right. It's General Electric. Wait, what? Yep, ironically, the same company that had helped EMC get started back in the day was actually now going to be their competitor. Prior to this, GE had actually been a strong partner of Alco and had worked with them on their diesel electrics, but they got fed up with Alco always delivering unreliable engines to them, even though they were giving them state-of-the-art electronic equipment. So General Electric said, fine, I'll do it myself. And in 1956, they were marketing their own Universal Series, Cooper Bessemer-powered diesel electrics as export locomotives. The export market was also something EMD had been looking into, and General Electric wanted to start there and see how well they could do on their own. By 1960, General Electric had introduced the U-25B, their first independent entry into the United States domestic road switcher market. This design was actually considered a worthy competitor to EMD, and they were compelled to actually take that challenge pretty seriously. So they upgraded the features of their general purpose models, as well as their standard duty series locomotives, boosting the power of their 567 engines and then moving to develop a more powerful 645 engine. Despite General Electric's strong competition, EMD still did pretty well throughout the 60s, and into the 70s, they produced what is probably considered their greatest creation ever, mostly because it may in fact be the best diesel locomotive literally ever built by anyone. In 1972, they introduced modular control systems with their Dash 2 line, and upgraded their SD40s, to SD40-2s. These were one of the most successful diesel locomotive designs in history, both in terms of sales and service longevity. Nearly 4,000 of them were constructed and they are still in service now. They were amazing diesels. However, into the 80s and the 90s, things started getting a little rockier for EMD. The high point of their career was probably the SD40-2s, because General Electric was delivering really good products and they were not given up. 
They were very good at marketing, just like EMD was, and aggressive with it. Even though EMD had introduced their new 710 engine in 1984 with their 60 series locomotives. By 1987, EMD's North American market share finally dropped below that of their main competitor, General Electric. In the 90s, they started trying to innovate, introducing AC induction motor drive in their own locomotives using Siemens technology. They also introduced a radial steering truck, which reduced wheel and track wear. And in 95, they replaced mechanical unit injectors with electronically controlled unit injectors on their 710 engines. That was great and all, but then in 1998, they introduced the four-stroke 16-cylinder 265H engine. Technically, they were actually the most powerful engine ever produced by EMD at the time, at 6,300 horsepower, but, uh, they were bad. Very bad. They were used as the prime mover for the SD90 Mac HS, but they were really unreliable. People hated them. They failed constantly. And it was a bad look for EMD, especially when General Electric was doing so well. In 1999, however, Union Pacific did still indeed place the largest single order Ford diesel locomotives in North American railroad history. They ordered 1,000 of the EMD SD70Ms, which the railroad apparently fell in love with. Their fleet has been expanded by more than 450 additional units, and they own nearly 500 SD70 ACE locomotives. None of those are, of course, powered by the 265H. They're powered by the 710 series engine, which are much more reliable. While they still struggled to beat out General Electric, they were doing okay, all things considered. A couple of hiccups here and there, but not the worst ever. But uh, their parent company, not so much. General Motors was finding itself in some financial trouble, to the point that it would have to go beg the government to bail them out, quite literally. But leading up to that, General Motors decided to put EMD up for sale. And that was in 2004. The company was eventually purchased by Greenbrier Equity Group and Berkshire Partners. EMD was spun off as Electromotive Diesel Inc. And the sale was closed on April 4th, 2005. They stayed with their new owners for only about five years though, because on June 1st, 2010, Caterpillar decided it wanted to buy Electromotive Diesel from Greenbrier for $820 million. Caterpillar themselves didn't do it, their wholly owned subsidiary, Progress Rail, actually wound up completing the transaction on August 2nd, 2010. EMD was struggling to appeal to the EPA's Tier 4 Locomotive Emissions Regulations. This put their 710 engine locomotives in a really bad spot, as they needed to modify or tune them up to meet the standards. And though it was technically possible, they couldn't actually do it and still maintain optimal performance and reliability for rigorous real-world conditions test. They eventually had to switch to a 4-stroke 1010J engine instead were delivered to the Union Pacific in December 2016. EMD is much smaller than what they were, and technically speaking, they're actually no longer their own company. I mean, they have been a subsidiary for a while, but now they've been reduced to a brand name. Progress Rail is technically the company now. EMD is not considered a separate company in any way. EMD is just the brand of diesels that they sell, but the company itself is considered Progress Rail. So, in a way, they kind of went the same way a lot of their older competitors did, being pushed out of the market by someone that was doing it better, and eventually becoming a shell of what you were, though in their defense they do still exist as a brand, and it's not like they're exactly gone, and the facility is still pumping out diesel, so it's not quite the same thing, I suppose. They still have several manufacturing facilities around the world, as well as a sizable chunk of the export market. Like I said, you can't talk about diesels in America without talking about EMD. They completely changed how railroads operated. Whether you like what they did or not is up to you. Some of their methods have been criticized as their marketing was a lot more aggressive than their competitors, but it was effective. And then they got a taste of their own medicine later from General Electric, and now they're just a brand name. As it stands, General Electric still has a 70% market share when it comes to North America leaving EMD with only about 30%. They're kind of a shell of what they were, but they did manage to go down in American railroading history, just like their competitors, Baldwin, Alco, and Lima. And as I always say, that is something you can't take away from them. 
And with that, a special thank you to all my underwater train finders. Some dude 267, Orange Glass, Benjamin Owens, no Spencer Kitson, 131-232, Josh Johnson, Metal for Life Guy, Anzac A1, Arthur Roy, Tommy Rossini, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Joshua Long, Brian, Jack Carson's Railroad Videos, Hayden DeGro, Master of None, Lord Hawk 444, Alaric Jaspers, The Baxter, That Guy with a Beard, Mark Holding, Lock Kraken, Murder Drone Stall, A Person 723, DM Trouble Typhoon, Hendrick Motorsports Fan 5, Alfonso Lapuche, Royal Hunter 2860, Icer for 1405, Charles Quia Matthew Wolf and Dr. Race78. Till next time, this is Darkness and a Bidjuala. Fond farewell.